K98 Talk is expanding its lineup for 2015. This means we are expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget, web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at advertise at k98talk.org. The leader in talk radio on the Internet, right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. It's time now for the Conservative Curmudgeon Radio Show on K98 Talk. Now, now here's, here's Grouchy. Grouchy. Good evening, America, and welcome back to a live broadcast of the Conservative Curmudgeon Show. I am sorry I had to be away last week, but uh, things happen in life and we deal with them when they do. Uh, but I am glad to be back with you and glad to have you back here with me. Now, we've missed a few things, but that's okay. We, we know what they are, and we know how to carry on. So where we are now is we are sitting on the eve of the first GOP presidential candidate debate. Tuesday, Fox announced the top 10 candidates who will participate in this Republican presidential primary debate in primetime tomorrow night. And as the polls indicate, Donald Trump will be at center stage. New Jersey Governor Chris Christie and Ohio Governor John Kasich secured the ninth and 10th spots respectively, ousting former Texas Governor Rick Perry, who finished at 11th, forcing him into the earlier forum with the quote unquote bottom seven candidates. I don't like that wording because, uh, Well, you'll know in a few minutes here. Anyway, um, Fox News claims to have used an average of the five most recent methodologically sound polling of the National Republican primary voters as of 5 p.m. Eastern Time Tuesday to make its determination. The top candidates and the quote-unquote bottom ones come as no surprise, according to Fox. So the top 10 who will be participating tomorrow night from 9 to 11 Eastern time will be in this order from top to bottom, Donald Trump, Jeb Bush, Scott Walker, Mike Huckabee, Ben Carson, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, Rand Paul, Chris Christie, and John Kasich. The seven other candidates who will have to settle for the one-hour forum at 5 p.m. Eastern Time are Rick Perry, Rick Santorum, Bobby Jindal, Carly Fiorina, Lindsey Graham, George Pataki, and Jim Gilmore. Now, the five polls that were used uh, were the Fox News poll, the CBS News poll, Bloomberg, Monmouth University, and Quinnipiac University. Now look, folks, 
I don't have a big problem with Fox settling on a method with which to pick the top 10. I know it would be an extraordinary madhouse to put all 17 of these people on stage and try to have a, a debate that didn't turn into, um, I don't even want to call it a circus because I hope they have a little more decorum than that. But just the, the logistics of that many candidates and questions and rebuttals and it's just a nightmare. Okay. What I do have a problem with is a complete lack of transparency in the process. Oh, sure. You know, Fox is telling us that, you know, the criteria, this is what we used, but how do we know if what they claim to be the outcome is actually how the polling went? Were you polled? I wasn't. I've yet to speak with one conservative-minded person, not one, whether in real life or on social media, who just flat out states that Jeb Bush is their man, and this is it. It's all Jeb. Everything rests in Jeb, and that is the only candidate that it can be. Yet this amnesty-loving, common core-embracing buffoon is second only to Trump in the polls? I mean, do you think that Jeb ranking so high has anything to do with the fact that Rupert Murdoch, the owner of Fox News Channel, is a super heavyweight campaign contributor to Jeb? I, why is Fox so easy on Jeb when it comes to real issues? See, my problem lies in that I don't know if I can trust somebody who is one of the heaviest financial donors to a campaign as an objective news source to tell me that the candidate that they're backing financially is ranked second out of 17 candidates across the board. This is a real problem for me, and I don't think I'm alone. And most people aren't even doing the research to find out how or why Jeb ranks where he does. He ranks there because that's where Fox News, which is Rupert Murdoch, wants him to be. Why would Murdoch put millions of dollars behind a candidate only to have to relegate him to the second tier debate team? It's not going to happen, folks. You and I are being lied to by Fox, and I think that many of the more conservative or libertarian types at their media outlet are walking on eggshells with Murdoch over this. I also think that before this election cycle is over, that one or two may be gone uh, from Fox for refusing to bite their tongues on, the, on this quintessential stay puffed marshmallow man known as Jeb Bush and how soft he is on issues that are important to conservatives. Now, Governor Perry, who just missed the main debate, and when I say just missed, it was pretty darn close. Uh, while I'm sure he's not happy about it, he tweeted that he's looking forward to taking the earlier stage and having a great exchange of ideas and promoting conservative values to the American people. Well-spoken, Governor. Uh, a spokesman for what apparently is the most confused candidate in the field, Rick Santorum, um, both claimed to welcome the, uh, the early stage and then called the selection process incredibly flawed. Santorum also complained and called the earlier debate session the happy hour debate. And Santorum's spokesman pointed out that Perry and Minnesota Rep. Michelle Bachman led early polls in 2012 but never won a delegate, which, if you think about what he's saying, only proves even more why Santorum doesn't belong on the big stage. He's nowhere. He has very, very core support. And when I say core support, it's about as big around as a broomstick core. And that's it. He doesn't relate to the large masses. Now, Fox News Channel host Brett Baer, who will moderate the main debate, along with colleagues Chris Wallace and Megyn Kelly, 
told Neil Cavuto that the three of them are trying to craft questions that will get the candidates off of their talking points and maybe into a area that they might not want to be into in this first debate. Bear did admit the moderators and viewers might be pleasantly surprised if everybody colors within the lines with the one-minute answers and 30-second follow-ups. Yeah, I can't see that happening. I, I see a lot of strain from that. Um, it, you know, here's, here's another statement. Uh, Our field is the biggest and most diverse of any party in history, and I am glad to see that every one of those extremely qualified candidates will have the opportunity to participate on Thursday evening Republican National Committee Chairman and perpetual fence straddler Reince Priebus said in a statement to the press. He also said Republicans across the country will be able to choose which candidate has earned their support after hearing them talk through the issues. Priebus also used the announcement as an opportunity to take a pot shot at Democratic frontrunner Hillary Clinton who, despite still holding a commanding lead, has seen her support sliding in recent weeks. Democrats will have to take Hillary Clinton's word that she deserves to be their nominee, Priebus said. While the RNC is moving forward with our sanctioned debate schedule, the DNC has yet to even announce when they will put her on stage. With the largest field of contenders in modern history, Organizers say something had to give to ensure the debate in Cleveland didn't turn into a nationally televised circus. Uh, Steve Dupree, uh, New Hampshire's representative to the National uh, Republican National Committee, who helped craft the debate plan, said there is no perfect solution and that we never envisioned having 17 major candidates. Republican officials work closely with TV executives Although the networks have, get this now, the networks have the final say about which candidates will be allowed on stage for the prime time event. Now, this is my problem with this. You know, what if you have networks that don't like somebody? These network news heads, they may not like that Carly Fiorina is a lot smarter than anybody realizes and they don't want her getting press time. And Carly Fiorina is much smarter than most people realize and should be getting much more press time and attention. Not to mention others like Rick Perry and Bobby Jindal. Uh, Bobby Jindal, by the way, if you missed it this week, uh, has cut Louisiana's Medicare funding going to Planned Parenthood in that state. So Planned Parenthood in Louisiana will likely be shutting their doors at some locations. So uh, I got two words for Planned Parenthood. They can suck it. Anyway, that's it on the debate topic. Uh, if you would like to chime in, give your two cents, or however many cents you have on that or any other topic, the phone line is open at 408-681-8255. That is 408-681-8255. And as always, you never have to talk about what I'm talking about because my show is based on freedom, damn it. And we're free to discuss whatever is important to you as a conservative. Now. At a recent Democratic fundraiser in New York, our president, Barack Obama, stated that he had ended two wars during his presidency. Think about that while I continue. In its recently released Human Rights Report on Iraq, however, the State Department said that the Iraqi government had lost effective control over a large part of Iraqi territory to the Islamic State terrorist group. Also, according to the State Department's Country Reports on Terrorism 2014, the group that the administration calls ISIL 
was founded in the 1990s by Abu Masab al-Zakari and fought against U.S. forces in Iraq before Obama removed U.S. troops from that country. Since then, the group has continued to fight and commit acts of terror in Iraq and elsewhere while seizing control over a significant part of Iraqi territory. Now back to uh, President Obama, he said, we've ended two wars. We've reestablished our alliances around the world in ways that make them stronger than they have ever been before. In its human rights report released in June, the State Department said, due to attacks and offensive operations by the Islamic State of Iraq and the large areas that the Iraqi government has lost control of are largely Sunni areas with some Sunni Shia areas mixed in. On June 9th, ISIL launched an assault and quickly captured Mosul, the second largest city in the country. Subsequently, ISIL forces took control of large areas of Anbar, Nineveh, Salah ad-Din, and Dayala provinces. The humanitarian crisis worsened in July and August as ISIL, as, the, as um, Obama calls. Obama, matter of fact, let's stop here. For those of you that don't know the difference between ISIS and ISIL, it's quite simple. ISIL refers to an ancient map that does not have Israel on it. This is what Obama insists on his administration using when referring to ISIS. The Levant, the L in ISIL, is a map that does not have Israel on it. So that tells you where his mindset is with the Middle East right off the bat. And don't take my word for it. Research it yourself, as always. So ISIS targeted ethnic and religious minorities, perpetrated gender-based violence, as well as sexual orientation-based violences, sold women and children off as slaves, recruited child soldiers, and destroyed civilian infrastructure. State Department says that large-scale and frequent killings, the vast majority of which ISIS carried out, destabilized the country. ISIS also killed, abducted, and expelled from their homes members of religious and ethnic groups, including Christians, Shia Shabak, Shia Turkmen, and Shia, or I'm sorry, and Yazidis. Not Shia Yazidis, that would be a contradictory term. In its country reports on terrorism 2014, the State Department outlined ISIS's long history of making war in Iraq, including against the United States. In the 90s, al Zakaria, a Jordanian-born militant, organized a terrorist group called Al-Tawahid al-Jahad to oppose the presence of U.S. and Western military forces in the Islamic world and the West support for and the existence of Israel. In 2004, he joined Al-Qaeda and pledged allegiance to Osama bin Laden. After this, Al-Tawahid al-Jahad became known as AQI. Zakari traveled to Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom and led his group against U.S. and coalition forces until his death in 2006. Later in 2006, AQI publicly renamed itself the Islamic State in Iraq. Although within the past year, the group adopted the moniker Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, which is ISIL, to express its regional ambitions as it expanded its operations to include the Syrian conflict. Since 2012, ISIL has been led by specifically designated global terrorist Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, a.k.a. Ibrahim Awad, Ibrahim Ali al-Badri, a.k.a. Abu Dua. In 24, he declared an Islamic caliphate as AQI, ISIS, ISIL, whatever the hell we want to call them these days, 
has conducted high-profile attacks, including improvised explosive device attacks against U.S. military personnel and Iraqi infrastructure, videotaped beheadings of Americans Nicholas Berg, Jack Armstrong, Jack Hemsley, suicide bomber attacks against both military and civilian targets, and rocket attacks. ISIS perpetuates the majority of suicide and mass casualty bombings in Iraq, and foreign and Iraqi operatives say. Whew. ISIS was active in Iraq in 2012, 2013, and 2014. In 2013 alone, it was responsible for the majority of deaths of over 7,000 Iraqi civilians killed that year. ISIS was heavily involved in the fighting in Syria during 2013, including against other militant opposition groups, and participated in a number of kidnapping incidents against civilians, including aid workers and reporters. In January 2014, ISIS captured Fallujah in Iraq and proclaimed an Islamic state there. In June, the group took over Mosul, the second most populous city in Iraq, and a large part of the surrounding Nineveh province. In early July, ISIS captured Syria's largest oil field, the Al-Omar. By late July, they took a Syrian 17th Division base near Raqqa, and in early August, the group captured the Iraqi city of Sinjar, precipitating a humanitarian refugee crisis when the Yazidi, an Iraqi minority ethnic group living in the area, fled to avoid ISIS atrocities. At this fundraiser recently, Obama said he is now thinking about his legacy. He said, I will not be on the ballot again, and my wife is super happy about that, but I do care about legacy. On December 14, 2011, Obama announced at Fort Bragg in North Carolina that the last U.S. troops would be leaving Iraq by the end of that year. He said, quote, but we're leaving behind a sovereign, stable, and self-reliant Iraq with a representative government that was elected by its people. On the campaign trail in 2012, Obama frequently pointed out that he had ended the war in Iraq. And this is a quote from him. You know, I say what I mean, and I mean what I say, Obama said. For example, I said I'd end the war in Iraq, and I ended it. Now, think about this. He's claiming to have ended this war, that we're still there fighting, that we had to put more troops back in to continue to fight. Of course, they'll tell you their support troops because that's what they're there to do is support. But what they're supporting them with are firearms, explosives, training, troop movements, tactics, you name it, our men and women are in the battle in Iraq. No two ways about it. Now, you might think I'm just blowing hard about this and I'm giving Obama grief, but retiring, outgoing Army Chief of Staff, three-star General Ray Ordierno says he believes that the rise of ISIS could have been stopped if the United States had not pulled out of Iraq just so President Obama could keep a campaign promise. General Odierno said in an interview with Fox News published Wednesday that it's very hard to watch Iraq implode in the hands of ISIS after the gains that were made during the Iraq war. Odierno said, I go back to the work we did in 2007 through 2010, and we got to a place that was really good. Violence was low. The economy was growing. Politics looked like it was heading in the right direction. He contends that if the U.S. had left more troops in the region, ISIS would not have been able to capture large portions of the country or near neighboring Syria. If we had stayed a little more engaged, he said, I think maybe it might have been prevented. 
I've always believed the U.S. played the role of honest broker between all the groups, and when we pulled ourselves out, we lost that role. Now, we've got some audio from uh, General Odierno, and I think that Mr. Producer has it ready to queue up and go, so if we could, let's go ahead and hit that, Mr. Producer. Outgoing Army Chief of Staff General Ray Odierno is painting a dismal picture of the future for both the military and the country. The general sat down for an exclusive interview with Fox News before his retirement in coming weeks. He served 39 years as a soldier. National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin has the general's exit interview. He spent more time in Iraq than any other U.S. general, more than four years, the last two as the top U.S. commander. Widely viewed as a key architect of Iraq's surge, General Odierno said Iraq didn't need to collapse. Well, it's frustrating um, to watch it. And I think a lot of hard work went into that, and we thought we had it going exactly in the right direction. But now we watch it fall apart. It's frustrating. Did it have to be this way? I think maybe um, if we had stayed a little bit more engaged, I think maybe it might have prevented it. I've always believed that the United States played the role of honest broker uh, between all the groups, and when we pulled ourselves out, uh, we lost that role as honest broker. When ISIS emerged back in June of last year and they sacked Mosul, did anyone from the White House reach out to you and seek your opinion? I, I All my work was given to Chairman Dempsey. But the president didn't ask to see you. You had served almost four years there more than any general. Uh, I, I, never, I, I never talked directly to the president uh, about it at that time. But I talked through the Secretary of Defense, and I, I'm sure they, he relayed on my thoughts. In 2009, while General Odierno was still the top commander in Iraq, he recommended keeping 30 to 35,000 U.S. troops. If the administration had listened to him and Iraqi government had cooperated, some say the rise of ISIS may have been prevented. So it was a mistake to pull out. Well, I think I think it would have been it would have been good for us to stay. General Odierno is most worried about the deep cuts to the army, which has gone from 570,000 troops to 490,000 due to budget cuts and political decisions. Under your leadership for the last four years, the army has been cut by 75,000 soldiers since you became chief, and now, uh, just before you leave, 40,000 more are being cut. How can you cut? the size of the force with all of these emerging threats. I believed at the time we could do that, but I said it was on the razor's, razor's edge that we could actually do our mission at 450. And that was before Russia asserted itself and before ISIS asserted itself. So with Russia becoming more of a threat, with ISIS uh, becoming uh, more of a threat, in my mind, we're, we're on a dangerous uh, uh, balancing act right now with capability. Uh, today, as I look at the Army, and we're, today we're about 490,000. Uh, we are just meeting the requirements that we have around the world. So when we go to 450, we're going to have to stop doing some things. What message do you think this is sending to our adversaries right now, these cuts? I, I believe they question whether we will be able to respond. And so they're willing to take maybe a bit more risk than they might have just a few years ago. And in my mind, we don't have the capacity to deter. What I remind everybody about, the reason we have a military is to deter conflict and to prevent wars. And if people believe we're not big enough or capable of responding, then they miscalculate. General. All right. So there you have General uh, This is This is the general that spent more time in Iraq than any other general spent more time in command of what was going on with U.S. and uh, um, international forces over there than any other general. And our administration, uh, when I say our administration, I refer to the president, um, didn't think it was important to take his input into account, didn't ask to speak to him, disregarded his recommendations, why? Legacy. He wanted to keep a promise. Damn the consequences and damn anything else that might come from the consequences. He wanted to keep a promise. Well, Mr. President, I can promise you this. We won't forget. 
because what you're doing to our military is endangering the men and women that are still there fighting because you're not giving them what they need. Now we're going to uh, wrap this up real quick here. Uh, the last thing that uh, General Odierno was saying is that uh, he thinks that with the cuts that are happening to the military and with what our president is doing policy-wise, that he sees 10 to 20 years to defeat ISIS, the group that Obama refers to as JV. 10 to 20 years. Folks, it didn't take that long to win a world war. Think about that as we go to commercial break. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. Oh, but ain't that America? You and me. Ain't that America? Something to see, baby. Ain't that America? Home of the free. The leader in talk radio on the internet, right here on K98talk.com. Red Nation Rising brings you Town Hall Radio. From a single tweet to three million a month, our community is a force to be reckoned with on social media. So don't miss our show Thursdays, 8 p.m. Eastern on K98 Talk. Our chat room is our co-host and you ask the question. Join us and be heard. So get ready to sound off on Red Nation Rising Radio. No one else is going to do it for you. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. We will never fully understand what we've asked of our military service members or their families, asking them to put themselves in harm's way, to endure it all. But we do understand that it's our turn, our duty, to keep them secure for the rest of their lives. Wounded Warrior Project long-term support programs help our most severely ill or injured veterans live independently, at no cost for life, so that they might stand at ease. Join us at findwwp.org. right hide the liberals here comes g um hey look folks uh i'd be remiss if i didn't tell you that uh i am so very grateful that you are tuned in tonight to my show here on uh, k98talk.com and i hope you stay tuned for according to me with jason de wilkins after because i know that you rode the rails with the rowdy one coming into my show Right, because you're staying for all three hours because that's how it is on a on a Wednesday night. It is the third night of the week. It is the trifecta of conservative talk radio on K98 Talk. Uh, but guess what, folks? We've got great programming every night. So do yourself a favor. Get your prime time hours set to radio, not TV, because TV sucks, especially during the summer. But in general, it just sucks. And we've got it going on right here on K98 Talk. So anyway, have you ever reviewed your budget and tried to figure out how to identify wasteful spending? Well, 
Congress reviewed its budget and its spending and came away with a way to cut back on waste and save taxpayers money by developing a partnership with the private sector to identify and curb waste. Now, what I want to know is how the hell did I not get included on this deal? They've got private sector telling them what's wasteful and what's not. Even though the partnership uh, allegedly works, it has been stalled. You see, those who benefit from the government wasting money are more interested in protecting the trough of federal largesse of spending your money in a more, you know, they, they don't want, they don't want Congress watching that money. They don't really care if Congress watches that money. They want that money spent with them. So Congress actually has passed several laws to help address wasteful improper payments. The office of management and budget explains that improper payments happen quote, when the funds go to the wrong recipient the recipient receives the incorrect amount of funds or the recipient uses the funds in an improper manner. I got news for you. That's not the only way improper payments happen. Right, Huma? According to the Congressional Research Service, one of those laws, the Improper Payments Information Act, or the IPIA, was designed to get an idea of the scale and scope of the improper payments. Another law, the Recovery Audit Act, required agencies that awarded more than $500 million annually in contracts to establish programs to recover overpayments to contractors. So, yeah, I mean, if we overpay them by a hundred million, but they only got 400 million. Oh, well, what the hell, right? Just let that hundred mil go out the door. What the hell's wrong with these people? At least 500 million, because less than half a billion dollars just isn't worth screwing around with, is it? The IPIA revealed that from fiscal year 2004 to fiscal year 2012, improper payments increased from $45 billion to $108 billion. I find that uh, number to be low and hard to believe. Congress now had evidence to support what many in the House and Senate suspected and most voters believed. The federal government was a lousy guardian of taxpayer dollars. You're damn right. To address this problem, Congress did, yeah, that's right, they passed another law, the Improper Payments Elimination and Recovery Act, or the IPERA of 2010, which amended the IPIA. IPERA increased requirements for identifying, estimating, and reporting on programs and activities susceptible to significant improper payments and expanding requirements for recovering overpayments across a broad range of federal programs. Okay, I like the sound of that a little better, but I don't know all the details yet. Additionally, Congress has recognized the importance of working with the private sector to help address the issue of improper payments. It established a demonstration program that began in 2005 in a few states to have businesses find and fix improper payments on a contingency fee basis for the Medicare program. Boy, oh boy, could I help with that. The relationship with the federal government and their private sector partners, known as recovery audit contractors, was so successful that Congress made the arrangement permanent in 2006 and mandated its establishment throughout the nation by 2010. In 2013, the RACs fixed a staggering one and a half million claims that resulted in a return of an impressive $3.75 billion, that's billion with a B as in boy, as in boy, howdy, that's a lot of money, to the Medicare Trust Fund. 
but the program has been significantly sidetracked since late 2013. This is due largely to policy changes at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which oversees the RAC program. Now we're getting to the root of the stall. Okay, those changes are related in part to how hospital stays are calculated, a matter CMS needs to resolve. Another roadblock to the work being done by the RACs is the medical establishment which benefits from the federal dollars. The accountability provided by the RACs has made some in the medical establishment who are used to the status quo uncomfortable. They have labored to weaken the RACs. While RACs are hamstrung, taxpayers suffer. RACs reduced improper payments from 10.8% to 8.5% from fiscal year 29 to fiscal year 2012. After RACs were hindered in their work, improper payments spiked to 12.7% in fiscal year 2014. The RACs had an accuracy rate of 96%. They achieved the success while only being able to review 2% of CMS's claims, and CMS must sign off on the claims they review. Now guess who runs CMS? That would be Secretary Sylvia Burwell. This is one of Obama's uh, right hands that's in charge of Obamacare. Now this type of successful stewardship of government programs should be emulated and not undermined. But as the bureaucracy dithers, our ship, <laughs> yeah, our ship keeps leaking money. The Government Accountability Office, in a March 2015 report, found that the problem of improper payments is massive. <laughs> You're kidding! Our government is wasting massive amounts of money. Who would have ever thought that? As the Washington Post even reported, the U.S. government forked over an estimated $124.7 billion, billion with a B, to ineligible recipients in 2014 alone, representing the first jump in over four years. The highest amount for the Obama administration occurred in 2010 with an estimated 125.6 in losses. Medicare reported the highest number of improper payments last year, with the program accounting for nearly $60 billion in incorrect disbursements. Rounding out the top three, were the earned income tax credit with $17.7 billion in lost revenue and Medicaid with $17.5 billion. This is real money, folks. It is being wasted on an epic scale by the federal bureaucrats as our nation sinks deeper into a debt that is already over $18 trillion. That's trillion with a T. RACs can help recover some of this money. They need to be allowed to help recover more of this money. The bureaucracy and those with an interest in the status quo need to allow this. Through RACs to save taxpayer money from improper payments by the federal government, the debt clock is still frozen, folks. Do you believe that our government is not debt spending while the clock is frozen? It's, they, they froze it because technically that's the reported debt that they're not allowed to go over by law. So they just stopped tallying the debt. I'm telling you people, they are screwing us over. And you need to be thinking hard about it. The debt clock tells us we're running out of time to get our fiscal house in order. And Puerto Rico is just the next step. Puerto Rico has defaulted. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. 
I told you they were headed for it. They had a $58 billion payment, I'm sorry, $58 million payment due last week, and all they could come up with was $6 million. It's time to get our house in order. And Obama's not going to do it. So it's up to the House and the Senate, who unfortunately are being led around by Boehner and McConnell, who are being led around by Obama. And while we're bashing on some Obama, let's go ahead and get employment. You might think that the drop in seasonally adjusted initial unemployment claims to a 41-year low in the week that ended July 18th is a good thing. But Lee Adler, editor of the Wall Street Examiner newsletter, says, think again. First, he says, jobless claims are actually stronger than they appear to be. The mainstream media is reporting this as if the record low is something new. That's because they look at the seasonally adjusted fictitious data only, said Adler. The actual not seasonally finagled number has been at a record low relative to total employment since September of 2013. Still, the seasonally adjusted number is quote-unquote remarkable, especially given that the workforce was much smaller 41 years ago, he said. But here's the problem. The current numbers are well beyond the bubble record lows of 1999 to 2000 and 06 to 07. The implication is that this time is really different. It is the bubble to end all bubbles. Recall that the stock market crashed in both 2000 and 2001 and 2008 to 2009. Employers in some sectors are hoarding workers, Adler says. Similar behavior in the past has been associated with bubbles and has led to massive retrenchment, usually within 18 months or so. Adler's not the only person predicting this, okay? There are plenty of other people out there that know this is coming. Elsewhere on the equities front, while the U.S. stocks stand at historically high valuations, valuations in foreign markets are much lower, and they're taking into consideration the money that our federal government is backing everything with. The S&P 500 index carried a trailing price earnings ratio of 21.24 on July 17th, up from 19.54 a year earlier. And Robert Schiller's cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio for the S&P 500, which includes 10 years of earnings, stands at 26.9. For months, it has hovered at its highest levels, excluding the pre-market crash periods of 1929 2000, and 2007. If the current level of U.S. stock prices is concerning, consider leaving home. Hmm. Other countries' markets are offering compelling investment bargains. He includes data from research affiliates showing 24 markets that trade cheaper than the United States. That includes the United Kingdom, Japan, Germany, Hong Kong, and India. And Market Watch columnist uh, John Kumariernos expressed particular interest and enthusiasm for British stocks. He said that the UK, UK's current CAPE of 12.4 is low compared to other countries and regions and below its own median of 14.6 using data going back to 1969. He says, moreover, investors shouldn't have to worry too much about currency exposure to the pound. Folks, this administration lied to get into office, just like all administrations do. He lied once he was in office. He's lying to us now about the quote-unquote strength of our economy. Do your homework can't stress it enough. Now, Obama recently also went to Kenya. And 
promoted homosexual and lesbian rights a week ago Saturday, saying that Kenyans had more pressing or, or pressing concerns to deal with, including health, education, and ensuring inclusivity of women. Kenya's president, Uhuru Kenyatta, pushed back against President Obama's promotion of gay rights. Shocking, but good for him. I'm glad he did it. While Kenya and the U.S. share many values, Kenyatta said during a joint press conference in Nairobi, there are some things that we must admit we don't share. Our culture, our societies don't accept. It's very difficult for us to be able to impose on people that which they themselves do not accept. This is why I repeatedly say that for Kenyans today, the issue of gay rights is a non-issue. We want to focus on other areas that are day-to-day -day living for our people. Enhancing economic development for women, health, education, infrastructure, providing power and encouraging entrepreneurship are our key focuses, said Kenyatta. Maybe once, like you have overcome some of these challenges, we can begin to look at new ones, he said. But as of now, the fact remains that this homosexuality issue is not an issue in the mind of Kenyans. The administration's promotion of the same-sex marriage and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, whatever the hell you want to call it, rights, caused rumbles ahead of Obama's first trip as president to his father's homeland, when some lawmakers and church leaders warned him not to raise the subject at all during his visit. But during that press conference in the Kenya State House in Nairobi, a reporter asked both leaders about it. Obama said his views were consistent and unequivocal, which is a lie because his views have changed on this issue. So that makes him both inconsistent and equivocal. I believe in the principle of treating people equally under the law, said Obama, and that they are deserving of equal protection under the law and that the state should not discriminate against people based on their sexual orientation. How in the hell would the state know their sexual orientation if they weren't trying to shove it up the state's ass? Okay, I don't have a problem with what consenting adults do in their own home. Okay, you want to you wanna get smarmy and, and you want to get bitchy about it? I don't care if you're gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender. I don't care. As long as you're not trying to force it on somebody else. Now, Obama compared the issue to that of racial segregation in the U.S., as an African-American in the United States, uh, of which he's only half African-American, he refuses to admit that publicly, though. I am painfully aware of the history of what happens when people are treated differently under the law, and there were all sorts of rationalizations that were provided by the power structure for decades in the United States for segregation and Jim Crow and slavery, and they were wrong, he said. Let's stop right here while we still have a couple of minutes. Obama was raised with a silver spoon in his damn mouth. The only time he would have been looked at differently was when he was with his white mother or his white grandparents who spoiled him as much as they could. What he knows about being treated badly is that he probably went to college for free because the color of his skin. Yeah, that's a bad thing, right? For him, right? Yeah, that's horrible for him, right? Come on. If you're fooled by this jackass's rhetoric, I feel sorry for you. Now, look, folks, we're getting to the top of the hour, and I've got to wrap it up and make room for Jason DeWilkins with According to Me. But I do want to thank you. Uh, yeah, not to mention his foreign aid as a student. Yes, uh, I, I running out of time. I didn't have all the details to go into there. But, yeah, uh, stay tuned for Jason. 
He's going to pack a two hour show into 60 minutes just for you. He does it every week because that's just the kind of guy he is. And make sure you tune in to K98talk.com for all your primetime conservative talk radio. Tomorrow night, game on with JD and Stacy and the big burrito, Red Nation Rising, right here on K98talk. Folks, I am your friendly neighborhood grouch. I will see you next Wednesday. Thank you and God bless for being here. Oh, but ain't that America? You and me. Ain't that America? Something to see, baby. Ain't that America? Home on the free. Yeah. The internet will never be the same. You're listening to K98talk.com. Whoa. Good God.